So I'm Tom Broker. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey in Menlo Park, California. And I welcome this opportunity, and I'm very thankful for AGI to talk about how we might communicate Cascadia subduction zone earthquake hazard. And again, we're talking about an earthquake that's shown as occurring on this big pink patch on the map on the right, um, or subsections of that fault patch. So uh, we've learned a lot of lessons from previous earthquakes about how we communicate hazards. And, and one of these is to provide the context of the, of the hazard and the earthquake, perhaps. Um, in the Bay Area, we often talk about the hazards in terms of what was experienced in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And in my presentation this morning, I'll be talking about um, the Nisqually earthquake as a, as a touchstone for people to get a sense of what the uh, Cascadia subduction zone earthquake might be like. We need to be realistic when we talk about the hazards. There's no need to, to make them larger than they are. Um, we need to be clear about what we know and what we don't know and make sure that everyone appreciates the fact that our knowledge is going to grow over time. Uh, we need to communicate our, commun our uh, messaging with emergency managers, engineers, and public uh, health officials so that we're all speaking with the same voice. If we have mixed messages, uh, that will lead to confusion, and confusion leads to inaction. And we need to make sure that we use a very simple language and, and we present the material in a variety of ways. If we want to encourage preparedness, uh, one uh, good approach is to show how preparedness has made a difference in the past. And a couple of examples that I like to use are uh, shown on these illustrations on this figure. One shows a retrofit house, and it turns out there were two adjacent houses built the same way at the same time with the same materials that the same property owner bought in Santa Cruz. And he retrofit one house before the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, but he hadn't retrofit the other. The retrofit house did very well and uh, sustained only a limited damage. The unretrofit house was split apart in four sections and required extensive uh, rebuilding and in fact, it had to be jacked up and placed on a new foundation. So a little bit of retrofitting can go a long way, and we know that that works. The other is drop, cover, and hold, and, and we like to encourage that, and we've just had the annual shakeout exercise yesterday, is that most injuries that result in earthquakes occur because people are pushed down by the earthquake or fall over, or things fall on top of them. So by getting onto the ground as soon as possible, and covering yourself, you can hopefully avoid most of the things that injure people. Uh, also what works is to, I found, is that uh, people like to know what's been done, what actions have been taken by governments and other agencies to prepare for the earthquake. Uh, once we tell people about the hazards, people want to know what they can do to prepare, so it's important to tell them that. And showing, since we're social animals, Showing pictures of people preparing can be very effective in leading others to take action. So it's been mentioned by Jeff and, and Chris, there have been uh, about six large uh, subduction zone earthquakes in the past uh, 50 years that we can learn from. Uh, three have occurred in Chile, one in Alaska, one in Sumatra, and one in Japan. And all of these have given us new lessons on how to survive earthquakes and tsunamis, uh, how to prepare uh, for these hazards, and uh, have improved our building practices. And after each one of these earthquakes, the U.S. sends teams of geoscientists and engineers to learn these lessons. And recently, there's been some good news. The, the modern building codes that are in place in Japan and Chile have really been effective in reducing the building damage in modern buildings. So that's really good news. Uh, the biggest lesson probably from all these earthquakes and tsunamis is that almost all the property damage and almost all the fatality, fatalities result from the tsunamis uh, that are produced by these earthquakes and the submarine landslides. So in terms of tsunami hazard mitigation, 
um, people need to know that things are being done. And, and, and so the hazard is being evaluate, uh, evaluated by tsunami inundation maps. Uh, once those are um, uh, developed, then evacuation routes can be established. Tsunami sirens can be put in place. Training of, of the populations and coastal communities is really important so that they know when the earthquake occurs, that's their tsunami alert and that they need to evacuate as soon as it's safe to do so. Usually that's when the shaking stops. Vertical evacuation structures are being uh, looked at as a, a solution for people who have long distances to travel before they can uh, make it out of safely outside of uh, inundation zones. And one is currently uh, being constructed in Westport, Washington as part of an, uh, a newly built elementary school. And you can see a picture of that in the lower, lower right. And as Jeff was mentioning, avoidance of the hazard altogether by uh, land use planning and zoning might be another tool in our tool chest to uh, mitigate tsunamis. But I want to return to the earthquake shaking hazard for a while. And I want to uh, make sure everyone's aware that the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake has been included in the USGS National Seismic Hazard Map since 1996 and in the building code since about 2000. And that both the National Seismic Hazard Map and the building codes are updated about every six years to incorporate the latest science into local resilience. Now, as I said before, and I want to emphasize, in both the recent Japanese and Chilean earthquakes, subduction zone earthquakes, similar building codes have been very effective in, pre in preventing significant building damage. Other tools for um, hastening and planning for these events are scenario maps, and I'll show some examples of these. As, and the USGS is also um, performing supercomputer simulations of what a subduction zone earthquake might look like and the strong ground motions that it will generate. And these include a realistic ge geological models of the crust uh, along the I-5 corridor and elsewhere uh, along the coast. And these all show that the ground motions in the I-5 corridor will be lower than th they are along the coast. And I'm showing you here a scenario um, shake map uh, for a magnitude 9, a wall-to-wall -wall rupture of the entire subduction zone uh, for Cascadia. And so the, the bright colors in this scenario map uh, correspond to the highest levels of shaking, uh, which are uh, intensities 7 or 8 or so. Now, um, the little inset to the left shows you an actual shaking map that was uh, uh, made from observations from the 2000 Nisqually earthquake, which was a magnitude 6.8. And one of the points I'd like to make is that the shaking levels from this Nisqually earthquake in the Puget Lowland are comparable to what we expect from the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake uh, in Seattle, but all along, not only Seattle, but all along the urban I-5 corridor. So that shaking levels, per se, are not expected to, do, to be any higher than the Nisqually earthquake type levels. Now, it's true that the duration of shaking is going to be longer and that a much larger area is going to be impacted. But the levels of shaking are something that we've seen before. And, the, and this, may not, this is kind of a surprising result from these uh, scenarios. But the, the good news for us is that the shaking levels are reduced by the fact that the earthquake is primarily offshore and is located at some depth. So that helps us reduce the shaking levels that we can expect. If we look at a smaller earthquake, similar to some of the smaller uh, patches that Chris showed in his presentation, say a patch that might produce a magnitude 8.3 earthquake, we see that this is still true, that the shaking levels along the I-5 urban corridor are about the same as we would see, we have seen in the Nisqually earthquake. Now, uh, Chris alluded to the fact that there are a lot of uncertainties and knowns about what the next uh, subduction zone earthquake is going to be, how big it's going to be, where it's going to start, 
um, and, not, and how far down uh, towards the coast it's going to rupture. And um, the advantage of the USGS National Seismic Hazard Maps is that they incorporate all these unknowns and uncertainties as different possibilities. And they also, they, including the possibility that one of these magnitude 8.3 earthquakes along the subduction zone could occur anywhere on the, on the subduction zone. We also have tools in place, and we're developing uh, them more to mitigate aftershocks. And we haven't talked about aftershocks very much yet, but uh, we've experienced in these prior large uh, subduction zone earthquakes that there are going to be very large and numerous magnitude 6.7 aftershocks that will begin immediately after the earthquake. And they were going to be widespread. They were going to occur along the main plain that produced the, the earthquake. They will occur within the oceanic crust. And some of these will occur in the crust of the coastal ranges. For that reason, they can cause additional damage. They can hamper rescue operations. And they can also take a psychological toll of people because they will be ongoing for months following the main shock. Um, the USGS routinely issues aftershock forecasts after large earthquakes, talking about the numbers and magnitudes of earthquakes to expect. And after uh, the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, the USGS set up a system to issue real-time aftershock alerts to rescuers working on a collapsed freeway. And that's based on earthquake early warning, where when we have an earthquake, it produces two different types of earthquake waves. Uh, the first wave is not very damaging, and it's followed by the more damaging waves shown in red here. We can, using sensors that are on the ground, which I think of, we can think of as tripwires, the sensors can detect the earthquake, determine its location or its epicenter, and then estimate its magnitude. And it can relay this information forward of the earthquake before the damaging uh, earthquake waves arrive. And we're currently partnered with the University of Washington at University of California, Berkeley, and Caltech to develop uh, a proto we developed a prototype earthquake early warning system called ShakerAlert. A so similar system uh, was in place in Japan for the, their magnitude 9 2011 Tohoku earthquake, and it worked for that event. Shake Alert will provide up to a few minutes of warning for a Cascadia zone earthquake. Uh, the farther one is from the epicenter, the more warning one will get. And it has many uses, but among the, those uses is that it can be used to provide aftershock alerts, which can help reserve, uh, reduce some anxiety, and it can certainly be used to inform rescue operations that are in partially collapsed buildings. As Chris alluded to, there will be a new coastline along the Pacific Ocean after this earthquake. And that's because there's going to be an instant and permanent lowering of the coastline of three to six feet, um, allowing daily tides to reach in uh, much further into low-lying areas. So we, one can think of this as an instant sea level rise as well of three to six feet. And so this will have an instant flooding hazard will result as, as well as a longer-term coastal erosion effect. And uh, this slide, the background of this slide shows Byron Atwater, a USGS geologist, and some of the, the dead trees that uh, died because the coastline went down um, three to six feet and uh, killed the trees you know, back in 1700. As, as both Chris and, and Jeff alluded to, we know we have vulnerabilities along uh, the subduction zone. We have a lot of built, although we have very good building codes in place now, there are a lot of buildings that were built before these codes. And so these are, some of these are vulnerable. Uh, the most vulnerable of these are unreinforced masonry buildings, buildings that have structurally weak first stories. Buildings uh, that are older and built in soft uh, soils and soft deposits. And uh, some of our taller buildings in sedimentary basins, which will shake at the frequencies that the uh, 
sedimentary basins will shake. Um, just, uh, just so that you know, both the cities of San Francisco and Los Angeles have passed ordinances requiring, mandating the retrofit of some of these most vulnerable buildings so that those cities are more resilient to the uh, earthquakes that they are expecting. We also have significant tsunami evacuation challenges. As uh, Jeff alluded to, um, this uh, figure on the bottom shows a, a figure from a recent USGS authored report that shows the communities uh, numbered up to 73 from Washington, Oregon, and California, showing the numbers of residents um, as a column and the color of the column or parts of the column reflect whether it's possible for those residents to evacuate the higher ground um, at a slow walk, a fast walk, or if it's not possible. And so uh, there are different uh, communities along the coast. Most of the communities are very small and they can be evacuated at a slow walk, but there are a few that have uh, higher numbers of residents up to 12,000 or so, and some of these uh, residents cannot walk their way to safety. Um, so we have different groups and different needs for uh, tsunami evacuation of planning and preparedness. I'd like to review very briefly, and this is one of my last slides, I think, uh, uh, an example of hazard assessment that led to a very successful mitigation. And this is an example of the uh, Alaska oil pipeline, which was constructed in the early 1970s. And uh, as the uh, planning for the pipeline was in place, they realized the pipeline would cross the Denali Fault, which is a major strike-slip uh, earthquake fault, very much like the San Andreas Fault. And so geologists went out to investigate the fault. And they determined that the fault moved, produced large earthquakes about every 100 years, and that the ground shifted during these earthquakes about 15 to 20 feet. So the engineering solution to that, that hazard was to place the pipeline on the surface on Teflon skids with the theory that when the earthquake happened, the ground would shift underneath the pipeline, and the pipeline would stay in place. And that's exactly what happened in the 2000 to Denali earthquake, which was a magnitude 7.9, one of the largest earthquakes in U.S. history. Uh, the pipeline performed very well. It didn't uh, spill a drop of oil, and the pipeline operations continued very rapidly. So that's a major success story. And it shows that uh, these hazards can be mitigated if we know about them in advance. And that's really my the last thought I'd like to leave you with is that you know, we're very fortunate in the Cascadia that we've recognized the hazard before the earthquake has happened. We can think of many examples in human history where this was not the case, like Pompeii, Caracatoa, uh, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, where the hazard was not recognized and it couldn't be mitigated. So here we have the hazard recognized, so now we can mitigate it. And to kind of reiterate what uh, Chris said, uh, along much of the Cascadia subduction zone, at least, um, the interval between large back-to-back, wall-to-wall earthquakes is something like every 500 years, about a 1 in 10 chance in the next 50 years of a magnitude 9. Now, to give some context to that estimate, the odds of a repeat of a magnitude 6.8 type Nisqually earthquake are about eight to 10 times higher. So if we prepare for a, a squally type earthquake, that preparedness will help us for the coming Cascadia event as well. So I think that's my last slide, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>